And so thanks, uh, I wanted to thank the organizer, Maxime and Norg and company and uh, for inviting me. I'm sad not to be there in person and see all of you in person, uh, but um, um, hopefully that will happen before too long. Um, so let's see, so my, my, and also thank you for everybody who's staying up uh, for the last talk of the day, must be very tiring over there in Europe. Um, all right, so my talk today is about topological frequency pumping in vile semi-metals, quite different than the last two talks. Um, let me thank uh, Frederick Nathan, who's a postdoc at Caltech, uh, who has done the bunt of the work, and Eva Martin, uh, uh, my close collaborator with, <clears throat> with whom I started this uh, project on topological frequency pumping. Um, now, as I'm getting used to the Zoom platform, I just wanted to add, please ask me questions during the talk, if you wish, just stop me, you know, unmute yourselves, yell something into the ether and I'll, I'll answer. Um, I'll keep an eye on uh, whoever has their cameras on in my other screen. Um, yeah, that works. All right, so, <clears throat> so let's start. Um, the, or, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, so with topological frequency pumping, the idea is to take a, um, a zero dimensional system, make it into a two dimensional topological insulator uh, via uh, synthetic dimensions. Uh, and then process that um, information into making a frequency pump and then trying to apply it to a material. What I'll show is that in file semi-metals, this idea of frequency pumping is almost possible right now. Now to get there, we'll start with uh, the background material that we need to understand this effect. Uh, so the thing that this relies on is the idea of realizing some spatial topological insulator phases in lower dimensional systems through driving. So the idea is to realize them in synthetic dimensions that arise due to multiple Fouquet drives. I will show you how you can get a zero dimensional churn insulator and topological frequency pumping based on the Bernovic Hughes Jenga Miltonian in two dimensions. And then last, I will show you this possible realization in doubly driven vial semi metal. All right, so let's go. So, starting with synthetic dimensions, let's just think about a simple periodic drive, but in the, um, in the slow driving limit. And we'll be driving with a Hamiltonian that, uh, or an amplitude V that's larger than the frequency of the drive. In that case, you know, solving for Floquet eigenstates is not really useful, but you could do an harmonic expansion of your dynamical wave function in terms of harmonics of the drive omega. If you plug this into time-dependent Schrodinger equation, um, what you'll end up getting is a tight binding model where instead of location, you have N, the number of harmonic, which indicates how many photons the system took from the drive or gave to it. Now, this tight binding model seems like a one dimensional model, despite the fact that so far, you know, the system could be just a spin half. Uh, what do we pay? for expanding our system with another dimension? Well, every time we take a photon from the drive, we have to pay an energy price that's written in this term over here, which is like an electric field in the synthetic uh, direction, N. So really the one dimensional space that we created with this drive looks like a, um, uh, <clears throat> looks like a one dimension, but subject to a force, which is just omega. All right, this idea has come up in the past by several, uh, um, by several uh, people in the field, Nathan Goldman, Jacobo Kawasoto, Sean Wifan, and I, I believe also others, but it's a very powerful idea. So I'm very enamored with it. Uh, can we do this in more dimensions? Why not? I mean, if I were a mathematician, I would pause here, but I'm not. So if we want to extend this to two dimensions, let's just think about two drives two incommensurate drives, omega one and omega two, imagine them having a magic ratio between them. We can't really do Floquet for this, but we can still expand the harmonics. So let's write a wave function for whatever system we're thinking of 
as a superposition of harmonics with n1 photons from omega one source and two photons from omega two. And then, um, and then each harmonic gets a time varying wave function multiplying it. Now, I have to say, this is not a unique expansion. This is not even a necessary expansion. It's just convenient. You know, clearly we can write everything like this. It's convenient because we can stick it into a Schrodinger equation. And I don't wanna show you the Schrodinger equation because in two dimensions, it looks really messy, but it ends up with a tight binding model by in two dimensions. You can get photon absorbed uh, from source one, that will be the N1, the X direction in this case, will be photons absorbed from source two, that would be N2. And um, now conservation of energy requires that as we climb up the N1, N2 plane, we'll have to pay energy based on this vector omega. What is this vector omega? Omega one in the X direction, omega two in the Y direction. And here is the force that's associated with that. Now, let me reintroduce the idea of energy conservation into driven systems. In this case, if we're thinking about a finite bandwidth Hamiltonian, then the system that's driven cannot actually take energy or give it more than its bandwidth, which means that it's bound to be confined in the synthetic dimensions to this strip whose width is the bandwidth of the Hamiltonian and it's perpendicular to the omega vector. So by moving over here, you know, the, on average, the system did not take or give energy from its driving tormentors. Um, any questions so far? So just um, formally, if you, from plugging in your expansion into H, how does mm -hmm. this, uh, how do you see this restriction? Um, you mean the restriction for energy? Um, so if yeah. you just, uh, uh, so this is the equivalent of Stark, uh, Stark ladder, uh, Stark linear ladder. So you have a Hamiltonian that has a hopping in 2D, minus this uh, uh, potential term, so plus this potential term. And then on average, this Hamiltonian should be conserved. The, the expectation value of this energy should be conserved. And that, that translates to this. Okay. Does that make sense? Thanks, yeah. But you will have hopping elements in this page hopping, which yeah. connect the red region to the outside of the red region? Oh, of course, of course. So the H hopping is just, uh, you know, it's, it's this. But now with N1 and N2, oh, okay. both. It's just a mess. It's just a monster to write down. <laughs> it's a bear to write down. Uh, is that okay? Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks. Awesome. Yeah, it's very important. We don't often think about energy conservation and driven systems, but, but it's useful if you take into account the drives as well. And it's essential for what I'm going to discuss because I'm going to discuss energy pumping between the two drives. Other questions? All right, so what do I do with this? My, you know, one of my promises was to uh, give you a two-dimensional topological phase in a zero-dimensional system. How, how do I do this? And this is by now uh, something relatively old. We, we've done this four years ago or so. Um, let's, let's think about, uh, one of our favorite topological insulator models, the Bernevig used Jenga Hamiltonian for a churn band in two dimensions. It has, a, it has a simple structure, sigma x times sine px, sigma y, sine py, and sigma z multiplying a constant Zeeman term plus cosine px, cosine py. Right, so this, is, this has the form of a sigma vector dot a vector, um, that's a function of px and py. And this gives us a churn band if m is uh, within range of the two b's. If m absolute value is smaller than two b absolute value. Now, how do I make this into a zero dimensional system? No problem. Well, small problem, but uh, in PowerPoint, everything is resolved. I'll just take px and change it into omega one t. I'll take py, change it into omega two t. I'll do it consistently everywhere. And now I have a new model, which is a, a, just a driven spin half that's driven by two elliptically polarized beams, sine omega one t, cosine omega one t in the x z plane, 
and then sine omega two, cosine omega two in the YZ plane. So two elliptically polarized beams that are crossed. In synthetic dimensions, this will be a Bernoulli Hughes Jang Hamiltonian. What would be the benefit? So BZ Hamiltonian has a Chern number in its topological phase. It gives you a quantized sigma xy. In synthetic dimensions, I'll show you that it translates into this spin converting energy from one of the beams, in this case, the red beams, the red beam into the green beam. So the red beam comes out depleted and the green beam comes out strengthened. Let's, let's go and see how it works. Okay, so first let's remind ourselves anomalous uh, velocity law. We all know what happens when particles move in a B field, in a magnetic field. We have a force that's proportional to B cross the velocity, or velocity cross B, depending on how you want to take the charge of the electron. Now, if you extend it to very curvature, then you get the dual of this. You get the RDT, the velocity, has a group velocity component, but also an anomalous velocity component that's the very curvature cross the force. In this case, very curvature in the Z direction cross the force on the particle. And the very curvature is the curl of the very connection, which is like the momentum space uh, vector potential. And here it's its definition, just the connection of our, um, of, uh, of our Bloch momentum states. Um, I did a small, some time ago, I, I made this small PowerPoint simulation of this. Uh, I guess PowerPoint animation is more accurate. We're not simulating anything. We're just illustrating. So here's a, a, a map of the curvature, of, of very curvature, of a typical BHZ band with parameters chosen such that the band has a turn number one. Here's the, so here in the center, um, the very curvature is strong. Let's think of a particle, both in momentum space and in real space, and pull it in the x direction. Now, every time that this particle will go through this high um, um, eye very curvature region, it's going to have an anomalous velocity on the right. Now, the motion in the x direction, however, will always be confined because of Bloch oscillations. So, roughly speaking, it'll look like this. You run this again. There's a motion in the y direction due to the anomalous velocity that can accumulate, but there's no motion in the x direction. We call it Bloch oscillation, but that's again a manifestation of conservation of energy. If the particle is staying in a confined band, a force cannot make, cannot do more work on it than the kinetic energy that you can absorb the bandwidth, and that confines it to stay in a small region over here. So that's anomalous velocity. I, I believe that's reminding you of anomalous velocity rather than teaching you it. How does it apply to our system? So we have a spin half driven by two beams, but the synthetic dimension mapping makes it look like an electron that sits in the valence band of a two-dimensional churn band. Oh, the churn says, well, I should say it right. It's like an electron that sits in the valence band of a semiconductor that has a churn number. So we don't have a full band, we don't have a quantized sigma xy, but we do have this lower phenomenal velocity. So thinking about this particle, it has some momentum, and now this conservation of energy, this need to account for the energy of the photons is like pulling that, uh, pulling that electron in some direction, omega, omega one, omega two, that will make the particle go through the Brillouin zone uh, in some random fashion, um, some quasi-periodic fashion, every time that it goes through a high Berry curvature, it's going to move in a particular direction on this energy conserving strip. And that's the manifestation of this uh, anomalous velocity. Uh, again, in parallel to omega, we're going to be confined by Bloch oscillations, by energy conservation, but motion perpendicular to omega could be directional because of the topological content of the underlying model. On average, uh, we're going to have a very curvature, that's the chain number over two pi. And if the two frequencies are incommensurate, our particle will average over the curvature of the entire Brillouin zone. Now, what is this motion up the red strip? 
it's like giving up n1 photons but absorbing n2 photons so giving up omega 1 photons but at the same time taking in omega 2 photons at the same not at the same rate of photons but at the same rate of energy the power done by drive one is the same as the power done by drive two but with opposite sign Questions on this. I'm very proud of this animation. I keep showing it. Is this a useful device and can be applied, you know, in some optics lab? Um, I, I, the, the question is a little, the, the answer is a little complicated. The reason why we're doing this is because we think it could be a really useful device to amplify and manipulate, say, terahertz beams. And that was the drive of this research in the, in the last two years. Uh, could we make a patent and be rich on this? I'll show you that the way is still, uh, <clears throat> there's still a road ahead for that. Um, uh, but that's the point of the talk, that it could be, it could be an interesting device that you know, ideally would uh, compete with um, uh, optical parametric amplifiers, but it's not as easy. But the idea is to bring it as, as much as possible towards an amplifier. Um, so yeah, uh, great talk so far. Um, quick question. You say the particle is moving in the upper left direction. That's because of course it's given by the direction of the vector omega. Mm -hmm. But who says that omega must be pointing in this direction? Why is it not pointing in the exactly opposite direction? Oh, that's a, that's a gauge choice, right? I chose my frequencies positive. Yeah, but if you say it's a gauge choice, but it has this physical consequence. Oh, sorry, it's not a gauge choice. It's the orientation. It's the orientation of the. It's the orientation of the circularly polarized beam. So the, the 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 ellipticity. Yeah, yeah, it's the ellipticity. You know, I could have I could have gone back to the model. What you're asking is, oops, there we go. What you're asking is why don't I have? Uh, yeah, I can take in in here. I can take omega to be minus omega. Uh -huh. Yeah. Right. For instance, but it also goes back. But when I say it's a gauge choice, is because you see this expansion over here. Mm -hmm. I could have expanded in negative harmonics. Sure. Yeah. Okay. But in order to keep this idea of energy conservation, you know, to to think about the direction of energy pumping, we had better have same sign for omega one, omega two, because mm -hmm. um, the sign of omega one is actually important because. Schrodinger equation is first order in time. So the, the, there's certainly a sign for positive energy versus negative energy. So this way we keep track of how much energy we take out of the beams, regardless of their polarization. So maybe I should say that you could formally take omega one to minus omega one. It's a gauge choice. Uh, it's uh, dictated by how you expand your harmonics of your wave function. Make sense, Uli? Yeah, well, partially. I mean, if I think about, you, you need to have some kind of time reversal symmetry breaking in here, right? Because the the, the proper process is that you like take photons from omega one and create photons from omega two. Now the time reversal partner is the opposite direction. Oh, so somehow, but that's different. So okay. so that that is there. And I'll tell you where. You'll see it right away when I say it. So we we are in the bottom band in this example. Mm -hmm. That gives okay. you chain number one. And then the opposite would be in the top band, chain number two. Now, of course, top band, bottom band is not time reversal partners in real space, but they are in synthetic dimension because that just means the spin at any given time is the opposite of mm -hmm. what it was. So that's exactly time reversal. Mm -hmm. So I have to make sure that I initialize my system in the lower of the two effective bands. Exactly. You can initialize it in the bottom. You can initialize it in the top. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that's how the effect is lost with decoherence. You know, as your spin is driven, it will become some incoherent mixture of the two bands, and then the average chair number would be zero. So actually, allowing it to relax to the instantaneous lowest energy makes it good. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you hit on all the right yeah. points. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Other questions? Uh, quick question. Um, mm -hmm. Hi. Perhaps you uh, said sure. it already, but I, I missed it. Um, don't you have, so if, if the ratios between the frequencies is, is incommensurate, don't you have um, some quasi-periodic uh, disorder along the strip which localizes you or? 
Because you said yeah, you that's actually uh, that's uh, that's uh, actually ties in with other works that I did with Young Peng on the possibility of getting. Uh, how should I say this? Oh yeah, the the title was uh, Majorana multiplexing for that paper. So I advertised that. It's great, great stuff. That's using exactly that fact that you have quasi periodic potential along this strip. I see. Nonetheless, here it's not localizing. Mm -hmm. And it's because of this churn number that's not localizing. Think about it like a net state. Mm. Um, okay, now, you may I want me to give paper. more information about why it's not localizing. There's no reason for it to localize right now because of this semi-classical dynamics. But let me assure you that everything that I said is supported by simulations of a spin half driven by these two beams. Okay. Like we can, you know, it's a mathematical simulation. We can just easily do it. It's, it's not. And, um, but it's, it's a really good point. You can use the, in the absence of this topology, you can use the localization in, in this direction to inhibit energy absorption in other setups. Okay, thank you. And yeah, so, so please go ahead and, and you know, if you have time, look at this paper, Majorana multiplexing. Sure. And it has, it has its time crystal analog. Uh, so I think, uh, Roman, it was you, right? And uh, Andrew Potter. And Philip talked about this. Yeah. And Philip talked. Okay, Philip. Okay, sorry, Philip, I, I forgot you. So uh, uh, apologies. But you guys wrote this paper that um, I think preceded ours on the interacting system giving quasi periodic response. Let me add that it's a really nice paper. Uh, their paper, I mean, not mine. Um, Alessio, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, other questions? Great. So, so let me continue. Uh, in this case, the quasi periodicity guarantees that I need to average over the Brillouin zone. So it gives me a quantization of this effect. Uh, okay. So, what is this effect? You can, so, so going to the left in n1 direction means giving up photons of omega one, going up in n2 means absorbing photons of omega two. And we can calculate the work that each, each drive makes by you know, taking dn1 dt, that will be omega, the, the very curvature times omega two. So if I multiply by omega one dn1 dt, I'll end up with the power, the drive one is doing. And I'll do the same thing for drive two. And you can easily see that both of them are equal and opposite. They're just omega one, omega two times the churn number. That's the topological frequency conversion. And it's quantized. Um, um, uh, the, the, top, the topology quantizes the rate of energy conversion and don't, don't be fooled by the talk about photons. It's not one photon of omega one becomes one photon of omega two. It's in the strong drive limit. So photons are not quantized in this case. It's energy that's being conserved. So it's a classical effect actually. Okay, so that's the basic effect. Uh, so qu questions on this effect? You good? Another question is, as Maxim said, you know, our goal is to eventually get a device on the market. Uh, so the question is what material can help us do this? And, and then looking at the Hamiltonian of a double driven spin made me think about a vile semi-metal because a vile semi-metal has a Hamiltonian, it's just sigma dot something. And that something is actually the vector potential um, of, of whatever electric field the vile material sees. And actually, there's something that I learned early on playing with Floquet systems. Um, you know, when you have something that's multiplying the vector potential, that means that you have an amplification of the speed of light in your effects. Because, you know, usually we think about driving spins, we think about magnetic fields. Those are weak in light. However, the electric field is strong and the vector potential, it's time dependence that gives you the electric field. That already gives, gives us a leg up um, so now the vile semi-metal, 
has sigma dot a, basically, sigma dot, the vector potential, for each electron, for each state, for each momentum state in it. So the momentum P is like an offset for the external drive, for the external electric field that's going to move the electrons around the Brillouin zone. Now I wrote a vector, uh, I wrote a vial semi-metal with sigma dot momentum plus a, uh, an isotropy of the velocity that has no spin structure. So if this anisotropy is very strong, then we'll get a type two vial semi-metal. We need to be strong, but not type two strong. And that's just an anisotropy in some direction in the Brillouin zone. All right, so this is new work now. New work requires new graphics. So, you know, I peeled my sleeve up and went to Blender and tried to draw something nicer. It took me a while to figure out to do this like, uh, you know, curly arrows, but it was worth it. All right, so, so let's do work. Uh, driven vial model. So instead of the double driven spin, we have this double driven vial uh, system with two vector potential, A1 and A2. Now, a highly anisotropic vial semi-metal you know, projected onto two dimensions of momentum, Py and Px, would have a vial node that looks kind of like this with a uh, Fermi surface that looks kind of like this. Just rotate it around to give you, uh, to give you the three-dimensional shape of the Fermi surface, kind of like an ellipsoid. But it's easy to imagine it in two dimensions for now. So here's a Fermi surface. We think about all the states below four, all the states above empty. Now our drive is really taking each momentum state into, into a trip, into a tour of the Brillouin zone. And this A1 and A2, they're really, uh, uh, they're just guiding the electrons to the Brillouin zone. And you can see that the, uh, the recipe that I gave based on BHZ will give you a torus in three dimensional momentum space. Not a regular torus, it's kind of like a cross between a bagel and a Klein bottle. It's a torus that closes on itself and then reopens the other way. And you know the hint is that the topology of this model will be given by whether the vial node is inside or outside of the torus. So let's see how that works. So single electron semi-classical motion, the momentum is shifted by the integrated electric field by the vector potential. Everywhere in the Brillouin zone, there's a anomalous velocity for the electrons because the vial node is like a monopole of Berry curvature. So that's you know, hinted at here, Berry curvature cross TPDT, but this is now a three-dimensional vector. So the motion in the Brillouin zone in momentum space is going to have to be considered relative to the vial node, which is the origin, which is the monopole of Berry curvature. Now we want to understand what the work done by each uh, electric field is. So here's the work by electric field one, by, by being one. We just dot it with the velocity of the electron. That's work, right? Force times velocity. Now, E1 dot, the component over here that comes from E1 will vanish. However, there will be work that's done by E2. So there's an R dot component coming from E2 from A2 that will combine with E1 to give work that moves from source one to source two. So if you plug in the part of R dot that's omega cross E2 and move things around in a triple product as we're used to, we end up with a power that's the average of the Berry curvature in 3D dotted into the electric field of source one crossed with electric field in source two. But what is this A1? A1 is just the momentum. It's just the shift in momentum due to beam one. This is the shift in momentum due to beam two. This is just the surface area of this torus in an oriented fashion relative to this origin of the, of the Berry curvature. So again, I can take away time, put in a parametric phase for drive one, drive two. I pay by multiplying by omega one, omega two. And what I end up with is the churn number of this envelope relative to this origin of the Bloch sphere. It's oriented, and I'll talk about it in a second. If the vial node is over here, we'll get a plus churn. 
if it's over here again, minus chain, because it's a bagel that closes on itself and opens up the other way up here. So, Gil, um, because there are so many questions, I would combine talk with question times, and there's about six and a bit total minutes left. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So let's see. So the expected scale of the power based on this is basically the volume of this, E cubed over omega. It could be huge. It could be, it could be 10 to the 9 volts per centimeter cubed. Uh, that's a megavolt per millimeter cubed thinking about frequency around terahertz in a field like a megavolt. It's generous, but not too generous. So the effect could be huge. Uh, but, you know, electrons act like ants relative to each other. They each want to push in a different direction. So depending on where the momentum state that we're looking at is relative to this envelope, we get different pumping. If the momentum state is such that the vial node is in the middle of this bagel, we get no pumping for electrons in this state. If we're looking at momentum states a little bit below the vial node, they go in a trip where, <coughs> which lands the vial node in the top part of the torus that gives chair number one. And then if we're on the opposite side of the vial node, this initial location in Brillouin zone, we'll get a churn of minus one because the vial node will be in the other side of the of this thing. That gives us a a power mapping of the Brillouin zone, KZ, KX, you know, that has some states pumping positive, some states pumping negative. So we need to make sure that we have more electrons in this region of the vial node than in that region. Furthermore, there's this envelope around the red and blue regions. And check it out. This is when the electron momentum sits on the envelope of this torus, it means that it's going to go smack through the vial node and heat up. Those are like ring of fire heating issues that are going to take away energy from our pump and destroy our effect. So that's the risk. Let's look more at this. So there's some work that to be done <clears throat> on this slide about the steady state that we'll get for the density matrix of this. Frederick bravely did all this work. It will be described in the forthcoming paper. Upshot from the steady state of the density matrix, you get, <clears throat> you get the same kind of expression, the same kind of pumping between source one and source two that's mitigated by the uh, filling of the various, uh, of the conduction versus the valence band in each momentum state. Let's keep those details because of lack of time and just go back to a qualitative discussion of what we get from exact numer from numerics of Boltzmann equation simulation for the system. We assume a relaxation due to Boltzmann. Uh, so we assume a relaxation uh, packed into Boltzmann equation um, and uh, putting everything together into a vial semi-metal, which is close to be type two, Fermi surface over here, full states, empty states, we see a strong conversion region near, <clears throat> where we expect it. We see some excited states giving us opposite pumping, too bad. We see this ring of fire of non-equilibrium states that are taking away power. And there's also going to be momentum relaxation along the Fermi surface that takes away power. So here's, <clears throat> here are the indications. And again, this ring of fire is due to an overlap of the electron with the size. So give me two more minutes and I'll be done. Conversion versus heating, I was saying optimally we can get huge amount of power, but this recombination is going to take exactly the same amount of power times the proportion of particles that are relaxed after the transition. Trust me, this is what Frederick says it should be. It makes sense. So if you have a lot of relaxed electrons, they can get excited again every time they go to the vinyl node and take away heat. That's not good. So we want the time of repetition relative to the time of relaxation to be large. We want an electron to go through the vial mode. Sorry, we want an electron to go through the vial mode, maybe get excited, but then stay excited. We want that time to be actually short relative to a relaxation time, tau r, in order to get an effect without this non-adiabatic absorption. Now, we calculated what would be the effect uh, as a function of relaxation time for terahertz. And we get that 
in order to get positive pumping, we need relaxation time in excess of nanosecond. That's, that's not good. Relaxation time of excess of nanosecond is not good, no matter how you look at it. Went back to the drawing board and said, well, I mean, the thing that we want to avoid is this non-diabatic heating by going to the vial node and then going away and relaxing somewhere else. We can actually avoid that by limiting our situation to two frequencies that are rational to each other. Then instead of having the full torus, we're going to have a Lisa Zhu shape in momentum space. And the very fast, so for every electron that goes through a vial node, a very fast repeat. The electrons that go through the vial node stay excited and don't absorb it. No ring of fire. If we do that, we get a suppression of the heating by one over omega tau r, which could be 1% even. We call that the Lisa Zhu regime. And if we put that back in to the numerics, we see this really large enhancement. And now instead of having to wait a nanosecond relaxation, a material with just uh, around 150, uh, 150 picosecond relaxation time would start giving us positive pumping. And that positive pumping, once it kicks in, it's really big, kilowatts per millimeter cubed. So the Saju case much better. And maybe I'll conclude. Uh, broader questions, material candidates, uh, discussions with Pre, Narang raised this uh, cobalt tin sulfur. We need near type two, we need no time reversal and no inversion helps, but it's not necessary. Now this should be thought of as fitting in with a set of nice works on driving vial semi-metals and non-linear um, optical effects in vial semi-metals. And with that, I'll conclude and beg for another minute of option for people to ask questions. Philip, up to you though. <laughs>